Uh, my name is Sherry Levy, and I'm one of the endocrinologists at Henry Ford Hospital. I have the pleasure today to introduce Dr. Gavin, and as I told him, I think he's accomplished more in his career than probably 20 people have in their lifetime. It's amazing. So I'm going to start by the introduction here. Dr. Gavin is a clinical professor of medicine at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia, and clinical professor of medicine at the Indiana University School of Medicine, Indianapolis, Indiana. He currently serves as chief executive officer and chief medical officer of Healing Our Village. And prior to that, he served as president and chief executive officer of Micro Islet in San Diego, California. He's also past president of the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. He served as senior scientific officer at Howard Hughes Medical Institute and director of HHMI National Institute of Health Research um, Scholar Program. Prior to HHMI, Dr. Gavin was a William K. Warren Professor for Diabetes Studies at the University of Oklahoma Health Science Center, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. He belongs to a number of organizations, including the ADA, American College of Clinical Endocrinologists, American Society of Clinical Investigations, and the American Association of Physicians. And he is past president of the American Diabetes Association in 1991. And I was hoping, is there a clicker, advancer? We were going to show a picture. There he is. I think this is, um, this is from a good friend of his who I kind of got these slides from. This is 1993. <laughs> and this is Dr. Gavin um, in 1994. Um, he served on many advisory boards and on editorial boards of the American Journal of Physiology and the American Journal of Medical Sciences. He has published more than 250 articles and abstracts in such publications as Science, Diabetes, American Journal of Physiology. Um, he has received multiple distinguished awards, including um, the Banting Medal for Distinguished Services from the American Diabetes Association and Distinguished Alumni Award from Duke University School of Medicine. Um, in 2015, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award for Diabetes Research from the American Diabetes Association and Lifetime Meritus Achievement Award from the NMA. He graduated from Livingston College with a degree in chemistry, earned his PhD in biochemistry from Emory University, and received his medical degree from Duke University School of Medicine. Today, he's going to speak to us uh, on the topic of, is, there, is this all that there is beyond insulin, new drugs for type 1 diabetes? Welcome, Dr. Gavin. Thank you so very much, uh, Sherry. It's a delight to be here. And let me uh, first thank President Dotson and all of the members and staff here at uh, Wayne uh, County Community College for their graciousness in once again hosting uh, this summit. Um, my commendations to all of the staff and the members of T1 Nation uh, for what you continue to do and for the hope that you continue to inspire by what you do uh, in the quest for a cure for type 1 diabetes. But along the way, towards that eventual goal, uh, so much has been done uh, in the effort to prevent this disease and to promote better treatment. So uh, I thank you, uh, the nation thanks you, and uh, by having diabetes of both types uh, in my family, all things diabetes are extremely important to me, and so this is uh, an important uh, honor for me to accept. I always have a little resistance in being uh, designated as a keynote speaker because uh, that sets certain expectations, uh, and, and I'm always a little leery about that. But I am going to talk to you about insulin treatment for di type 1 diabetes, and the question that I'm going to pose, and I'll explain uh, this in a moment, is that all there is? Because what we really want to do is to look beyond insulin and consider, are there really other drugs for type 1 diabetes? Now, I've told you a little bit about my reluctance to have this viewed as a keynote, so I'm, I'm going to manage or titrate expectations around this talk. Um, 
a little bit at least, by making it clear about what I'm not going to talk about. A and I think that will help uh, uh, titrate things. I'm not going to talk about the, the work that's being done on insulin itself. I mean, this is a still a dynamic area. Uh, no matter how long we've had insulin available to us, people are making uh, smarter insulins, ge genetically uh, and biochemically modified insulins that are capable of acting just like the insulin acts in our own bodies. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about some of the things that have been alluded to by President Dotson in his opening remarks about some of the, the, the new directions that we're moving in with the artificial pancreas and with some of the ma magnificent technology that we have now in terms of sensor technology, things that have really revolutionized our ability uh, to uh, uh, treat uh, diabetes, uh, type 1 diabetes in an ongoing way and to know exactly where we are uh, at any given moment in terms of, uh, of treatment um, uh, interventions. And I'm not going to talk about all of the excitement that, that, that there is in uh, cellular uh, uh, approaches, transplantation, encapsulation approaches, uh, the coupling of those uh, kinds of technologies uh, with new devices and smart insulins. There is so much going on that's really, really exciting that I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to ask the question, is that all there is? And this really brings me back to a reflection on a, an old song that most of you are simply not old enough to remember. Song by Peggy Lee, is that all there is? And in this song, it was also sung by Bette Midler, and in the song, she poses a question as she um, recounts reflections of when her father grabbed her up in her pajamas when she was a little girl because their house was on fire. And she watched the house burn down. And at the end of it all, her question was, is that all there is to a fire? If that's all there is, then let's keep dancing. And then she went on in the song to talk about the time she went to a circus and she saw clowns and whirling acrobats and all of the glory and magnificence of a circus. At the end of the day, she said, is that all there is to a circus? If that's all there is, then let's just keep dancing. And then she talked about falling in love with a boy and breaking up with him. She thought she would die at the breakup, but she didn't. And so she wondered, is that all there is to love? If that's all there is, let's just keep dancing. Let's have a drink and have a ball. And then ultimately, those of you who remember the song said, she, she was asked, well, if, if you're that cynical about everything, why don't you just end it all? And she said, no, I can't do that because I am quite sure that at the moment I take my last breath, I'm going to say, <laughs> is that all there is? And so I was thinking about that because when it comes to how we have often considered type one and for a while, type 2 diabetes, when we think about how we've summarized what this disease is all about, you know, that it happens early onset, the whole of the pathophysiology was summarized in you lose your beta cells. You have an absolute dependence on insulin for treatment thereafter, and you're ketosis prone. Is that all there is? And with type 2 diabetes, for a while at least, we used to think of this as later onset, insulin resistance, not so much insulin deficiency, but you're not prone to ketosis. And, and, and people used to ask, is that all there is? But with type 2 diabetes, we suddenly found ourselves faced with this explosion of knowledge that said, this is a complex pathophysiology. And we had things like what you see here what's called the ominous octet, all of the different organ systems that contribute to the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. It doesn't stop there. We published some work last year, some colleagues and I. It's the egregious 11. So we still march on with the complexity of type 2 diabetes. So even this is not all there is. And we've finally, over the years, gotten to a point where we're exploring all of the complexity and the fascination 
of the underlying pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes. We know that there are genes involved. It's heterogeneous in many ways, just like type 2 diabetes. There are a lot of environmental factors that are important in the onset and perpetuation of this disease. There are autoimmune factors. I work with a startup company that's trying to control some of the immune contributions to this disease in order to prevent it. But you know, the fact of the matter is that with the knowledge that we have about type 2 diabetes, we've taken that knowledge and we've used it to come up with an explosive array of therapies. I mean, in the last 40 years, we've had over 40 new agents approved for type 2 diabetes. What's interesting to me is that insulin was made, was discovered, made commercially available shortly thereafter, 1921. And over the years, you know what we've really largely depended on for treating type 1 diabetes? <laughs> insulin. And I think it's a legitimate question. Is that all there is? Well, the fact of the matter is, it took over 80 years for us to add to the arsenal of treatment for insulin. And I was actually on the Amelin board, the company was called Amelin at the time, two classes of drugs, exenatide and uh, uh, Amelin or pramlintide were introduced into the marketplace. Synthetic Amelin was introduced in 2005. Now, what is it? What does it have to do with type 1 diabetes? And I submit that there are probably reasons why more of you aren't really familiar with it. In the pancreas, in the beta cell, we have insulin and we have amylin produced. It turns out that they are co-secreted. You eat a meal, we know that the expectation is that in the normally functioning beta cell, you're going to get an insulin surge if everything is working well. Well, you also get an amylin surge. They are co-secreted, as you see here. They track one with the other. Now, if you look at what happens in diabetes, it doesn't matter whether it's type 1 or type 2. There is a deficiency of amylin. And you see here at the bottom the deficiency of amylin. You, you see a meal is, is given, and, and under uh, normal circumstances, you see this surge of amylin, just like you'd expect. And if we had insulin on this, we'd also see a surge of insulin. In type 2 patients, no surge. In type 1 patients, no surge. There is a deficiency of amylin. Okay? Now, the question becomes, all right, I don't make it. So what's the big deal? What am I missing out on? And, and it turns out that there is some physiology that becomes important because there is a contribution to the regulation of our blood sugar by amylin. We talk a lot about the relative roles of insulin and the relative roles of glucagon. We rarely talk much about amylin. But it turns out that, just as I showed you, amylin is co-released with insulin after you eat a meal. What it does, it slows down the rate of motility of your stomach. And of course, that means that whatever you've eaten is going to be absorbed a little bit more slowly. It's going to appear in your circulation a little bit more slowly. But it also has an important contribution in suppressing glucagon from the alpha cells. And remember, glucagon helps to drive the liver to make more glucose. Okay, so glu glucagon is pushing, uh, the, the, the trend for, for glucagon is to push the sugar levels up. Okay? And, and, and the other thing that, that what, what happens is that you benefit from that by suppressing glucagon. You, you have less uh, pressure in terms of uh, another contribution of increased blood sugar. 
And, of course, it helps you suppress appetite. So you're not inclined to want to keep eating. You actually have the ability to, sus to experience satiety. And this is all good in terms of glucose regulation. So let's, let's set some ground rules, some important definitions. Amylin is what's made in the beta cells. It's the thing that is co-secreted with insulin under normal circumstances. The thing that we, we produced by recombinant DNA technology in the hormone uh, uh, world is a, called pramlentide. Uh, that's the, the synthetic analog and it is marketed as simlin. So when we use all these terms, they, they all mean pretty much the same thing, okay? And this is how it's produced in the marketplace, how it appears. This is what it can do in type one diabetes, okay? What you see in the grayish circles is the glucose profile after a meal or after a glucose load in the presence of Lyspro insulin. You see a surge. So the glucose still goes up, but under the influence of the insulin, it comes down. What happens if you give that same insulin, but combine it with some of that pramlentide? You get the red line. The surge is gone, okay? And what happens with this particular approach to treatment is demonstrated here. You know, we've always been concerned about fluctuations in glucose, and that doesn't matter whether you have type one or type two, okay? What we've really been trying to do is to, 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 to attenuate, dampen a lot of that variability, and that's basically what amylin does. From baseline in the green where you see those peaks and valleys, six months of therapy with this approach, and you see you just don't have those fluctuations. It's almost flatline glucose. It's a pretty good looking thing. I mean, think about it. It takes all of the hills and, 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 and mountains out of glucose patterns. So why don't more of us know about it? Why don't more of us use it? Because <laughs> there is an ugh factor. And we have to be, you know, clear about that. If you used insulin with uh, pramlentide, you, you, you basically have to cut back on your insulin dose because if you're not getting those surges, well, you don't need as, as much insulin. And generally, the recommendation is that you reduce your, the amount of insulin that you take, but you have to be prepared to adjust your insulin uh, after you initiate therapy with this uh, new approach to treatment over time, depending on what you get from your glucose monitoring. So you start low and you go slow. You escalate the dose. So there is some complexity to using this, okay? And, and it turns out that you gotta be careful because there are levels that you get to where you start hugging the toilet bowl, okay? Because there's a factor. Nausea can be a significant problem and in fact, that is one of, the one of the big problems was why there wasn't greater penetration because you have to cut back on the dose if nausea becomes a problem and the higher doses aren't well tolerated. Okay, so what could this possibly mean for you? Well, there is some good that could come out of an approach like this. And the good would be you could lower your A1C and you could do so by about a half a percent using this along with insulin. You could actually even lose a little weight with this. This has all been shown. And of course, I already showed you the power of this approach in reducing the fluctuations of glucose. And you would likely l use less insulin. But there is this <laughs> ugh fact it can worsen, and it can cause and, and worsen nausea. If you aren't careful, it can actually lead to hypoglycemia, but probably the biggest drawback, it means an extra shot, an extra shot before every meal. 
and that's just the way it is. So whether or not this is something that's fit for you or not fit for you, suited for you, is something that you need to be aware of, talk to your health care provider. But it prompts another question. All right, I knew I didn't make insulin, but here you are now, Mr. Keynoter, telling me that I don't make amylin? Is that all there is? Well, what other hormones do I have problems with? I'm glad you asked, okay? <laughs> because there is another family of hormones that, that, that are called the incretins, the major one of which is called GLP-1. That stands for glucagon-like peptide. It actually has no resemblance to glucagon, but the story behind that is too long for me to tell. Just take me at my word. It's GLP-1 is what we call it, okay? And what we know about this is that if you eat stuff, there are some special cells in your body that upon the arrival of nutrients into your gut, these cells produce these incretin hormones. They're immediately released into the bloodstream. They're generally acted upon by some local enzymes that degrade them very quickly. But when they get into your bloodstream, they actually can do a number of things. At the level of the beta cells, they can enhance the ability of the beta cells to respond to glucose in an, uh, 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 to, by insulin secretion in a glucose-dependent fashion. In other words, if glucose shows up, you get insulin secretion. If there's no glucose that shows up, nothing happens. So it's a glucose-dependent insulin secretion, and that's a good thing. It also works on the alpha cells by causing glucagon levels to be suppressed. Remember that we, we don't need glucagon when we're eating stuff because glucagon is going to drive your, glu your glucose up higher at a time when we want it to be coming down. And the liver is, is, is not going to be contributing to glucose in your body uh, after meals uh, when these uh, incretins like GLP-1 are around. And then it slows your stomach motility down, just like that amylin did. Now, all of these are pretty good uh, effects, including the promotion of the feeling of fullness. Satiety is enhanced. But one of these doesn't really help you in type 1 diabetes, and that's this one. It doesn't help stimulate beta cells to respond to glucose in an insulin, with, with an insulin response because the beta cells are largely just not there. They're not available. But that leaves a whole lot of other things that might possibly be influenced in a beneficial way. And it's something that people have found worthy of looking into. These are the glucagon responses in type 1 patients following, an, in blue, an oral glucose challenge, and in white, uh, uh, an IV glucose challenge. And what you see, compared to the healthy controls on the right, following and an oral glucose load, people with type 1 diabetes on the left have this surge of glucagon. You don't need that. That's not what you want, okay? You, you really don't want glucagon popping up at a time when you'd like for your blood glucose to be going down. Well, it turns out that if everything were ideal, if you have some residual beta cell function, like on the left, then GLP-1 treatment in type 1 diabetes would actually cause a little bit of insulin secretion to be enhanced, suppression of the glucagon to occur, slowing down of the emptying rate of the stomach, and at the end of the day, you see those two red arrows next to plasma glucose, you'd actually get a beneficial result of plasma glucose going down. If you don't have any residual beta cell function, if you basically are just bereft of beta cells, you see that on the right side of this panel, well, there are not a whole lot of things that could happen, but you can get some reduction in glucagon, gastric emptying slows down, and plasma glucose can actually go down 
Maybe, maybe by not quite as much. But nevertheless, something comes out of this approach. And the question is, uh, does it modify your insulin dose? Does it change your risk of hypoglycemia? And some people, including this little startup company that I worked with, Micro Islet, some years ago, we actually pre-treated encapsulated islets with GLP-1 to see if we could, in fact, preserve uh, those uh, islets better once they were implanted. That's another story that I just won't go into right now. So we have a whole lot of these GLP-1 agonists now that are available for treatment. And they run the spectrum. They're the short-acting ones, the one by ETA, which is a twice a day uh, injection. There is now um, uh, a series of once a day uh, uh, injections, uh, what, what this one at least, Victoza, uh, Liraglutide. And then we have a whole family of these agents that are available for injection once a week. And there is now a submission before the FDA of one of these kinds of GLP-1s that's going to be available in an implantable form for once a year. So things are happening. And the question becomes, OK, why are you standing up here telling me about this? Do these things actually work in type 1 diabetes? Because if they don't, stop wasting my time at the T1 Nation Summit. Well, OK. I'm, I'm glad you were insistent because here's some, some data. Because this comes from studies on type 1 patients who were on Victoza, one of these GLP-1 receptor agonists, for six months. And what you see are two columns, week three columns, really. But you see before treatment, data on a bunch of things, weight, A1C levels, insulin doses, blood sugars, and so forth. And what you see is that after six months on this drug, there was a reduction in weight, a reduction in A1C. There was a reduction in the insulin doses, both the basal and the bolus insulin. And in fact, when you look at the uh, glucose, continuous glucose monitoring uh, uh, tracings, you see before treatment with this agent, you see that not a whole lot of time was spent in range, okay? Afterwards, you see that things really smoothed out a great deal. There was a great deal more time in range, okay? So this is really promising stuff, okay? Because what it says is that this approach in type 1 diabetes offers some promise. A meta-analysis, that is the, a, a combined assessment of a variety of studies um, was performed. And this was a meta-analysis that was actually presented this year. And it was uh, a meta-analysis looking at patients with type 1 diabetes who were overweight or obese. Because one of the other things that can, can uh, happen with this type of drug, with these GLP-1s, is that you can actually get uh, weight loss. Okay, the, 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 the one that's used for diabetes is really supposed to be for diabetes. Weight loss is a secondary benefit, but there is, with this same molecule, a preparation that is specifically used for weight loss. Victoza is the diabetes one, Saxenda is the weight loss one. But these were multiple studies, and all of these studies were evaluated to see what happens on certain metrics that are important for type 1 diabetes. Well, what they found in this meta-analysis is almost a 0.3% reduction in A1C. There was a reduction in the daily basal dose of about 2.5 units, a reduction in the bolus insulin dose of about 4 units, and approximately 10 pounds of weight loss. So this is injected from a pen. Three different doses, you have to start with a low dose and you titrate up according to a certain predetermined pace, depending on tolerance and response. And one might 
likely have to reduce their total daily, da daily dose of insulin, daily dose, uh, daily dose of insulin by about 20%. What do you worry about? Anything that you give that changes motility rates of the stomach, nausea, is a potential side effect. And that is the case here. But there's also been concerns about thyroid cancer and pancreatic disease, pancreatitis being one of them. Uh, th these, are, these are pretty, uh, uh, pretty significant uh, uh, complications. But what I would say to you is that the reason there's a black box warning about things like thyroid cancer in these, uh, for these drugs is because they were observed in rodents in the lab studies. Now, rodents have a very different collection, uh, a, a diff different set of receptors for these, pet, uh, these particular hormones in their thyroid glands, um, and they are more susceptible to um, stimulation and tumor production. But because those tumors in rodents occurred at doses that would be, that would overlap with the doses used in humans, the FDA said you gotta have a black box warning, okay? And because pancreatitis was seen, uh, pancreatitis had to be included in the warning. Now, there really haven't been, to my knowledge, any cases of, of um, thyroid cancer observed by treatment with these agents. In one case, there was one, I think it was in one of the clinical trials, but that case was in the um, placebo group. But, but, but the FDA was sufficiently worried about the public's concern that they had a conference on pancreatic safety of these drugs. Um, both the FDA and the equivalent of the FDA in Europe, the EMA. And what you see here is this quote. The FDA and the EMA have explored multiple streams of data pertaining to a pancreatic safety signal associated with these incretin-based drugs. And the reason they had to be worried about this is because people were seeing these advertisements and coming to us, having heard from these 1-800-bad-drug uh, lawyers, I always wonder, why are you watching television at 2.15 in the morning anyway? <laughs> you know, when these people, if you have taken Victoza or Genuvia and have suffered pancreatitis, <laughs> then you should call Slepper and Slotsky. Now, I mean, I don't know, but there was concern. So both agencies came to an agreement that assertions concerning a causal association between these drugs and pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer, as expressed in the scientific literature and in the media, are inconsistent with the current data. In other words, the signals coming from the data don't align with the signals that are coming across your TV screens, okay? So this was a very important uh, statement and, and, and very encouraging because those data of potential benefits were actually pretty, um, pretty reasonable. And they appear to work, but are they approved for type one diabetes? No, I'm sorry. Any chance then I could take a pill? Well, it turns out that they are now a new class of pill called the SGLT2 transporter inhibitors. SGLT2s, we just call them. And these are the ones that are approved on the market. And it turns out they are unique in what they do. Because these drugs work in the kidney. And they do something that when I was in medical school, my professors at Duke hammered into my head was a bad thing. They told me no good ever comes out of having glucose in your urine if you have diabetes. Well, you know, they, they were talking based on the extent of our knowledge at the time. Well, it turns out that this is a long, complicated story, but I'm going to try to give you the crib note version here. What we know is this. If your kidneys are working properly, your kidneys 
filter your entire plasma volume 40 times a day. If your average blood sugar is, say, 100 milligrams per deciliter, that means your kidneys are filtering 180 grams of glucose a day. That's a lot of glucose. If you put that many sugar cubes in one of those plastic soda pop bottles, you'd see a lot of glucose. But yet none of that comes out in your urine under ordinary circumstances. And why is that? It's because in the kidney proximal tubules where the filtrate goes on the way to being urine, there are these transporters called SGLT2s that actually capture glucose, this, this blue molecule here, they capture that glucose and put it back into the bloodstream. It does not go down to the bladder. It doesn't come out in the urine, okay? Now, the problem is that with, with diabetes, when blood sugars are high, more of these transporters appear. And what do they do? They do what they do. They put more glucose back into the bloodstream, which is not what we would really want. You'd really want the kidney to be an exit route for excess glucose, but that doesn't happen until the glucose is way high, 225, 240. The kidney's not really helping us under those circumstances. It really has betrayed us. So we've taken the knowledge about this transport system and new tools have been developed, drugs that actually interfere with the action of these transporters. They block them, these drugs that I showed you in those three boxes. They block these transporters, so now they can't take that glucose and put it back into the bloodstream. It actually has to go out in the urine, okay? So now, glucosuria, the elimination of glucose through the urine has become a therapeutic intervention. My professors actually turned out now that they, they, they weren't really telling me the whole truth. But of course, they didn't know about all this, and we certainly didn't have these tools. This is a mechanism of lowering blood glucose that does not depend on having beta cells, okay? So it's a new mechanism. Now, what does it mean when you really look at what happens in people? Well, if you look at these data, this looks at the change in average glucose after seven days on this particular kind of medicine. And what you see is that the blood glucose levels are trending down. And when you look at the percent change in how much insulin is required, this is in type 1 diabetes, I should point out. The average daily insulin requirement is also trending down, okay? So what we have here is, is a mechanism for bringing blood glucoses down that don't depend on having functioning beta cells in the way that some of these other agents, including those inquitins, require. You know, sulfonylureas and all these other secretagogue drugs require beta cell function. This, this, this approach doesn't. But there are some secondary benefits that you get from this approach. Whenever you get rid of glucose through urine, it means that your body is taking what we call an osmo. It's a, a, a particulate. You know, glucose is, you know, it, it's a crystal that's been now put in solution. But we're not like birds. Birds can actually get rid of impurities and particulate matter in solution in their bloodstream, they can get rid of that through solid waste. And if you don't believe me, just park your car under the wrong tree one day. Okay? <laughs> but they have a special organ in their body, it's called a cloaca, that allows them to get rid of things like that through their solid waste. We can't, we have to get rid of things like excess glucose by taking water with it, called urine. But when you do that, you create what's called an osmotic diuresis. You have to have extra water because we cannot urinate crystals. And when you do that, you can actually cause your, 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 your body's volume to go down. You can actually get low blood pressure. But 
on the positive side, you can actually bring high blood pressure down. So there's a blood pressure benefit that you can get. It's not a blood pressure lowering drug, but it's a secondary benefit. The other thing that you do when you get rid of glucose that way, you're getting rid of calories. And over time, when you get rid of calories, you lose what? Weight. So the secondary benefit here is weight loss. But there are some downs, there's a downside. There are adverse events, and one of the most common adverse events is that there are more yeast infections. More in women than in men, but treatable, generally transient in nature, and uh, uh, you, you can actually get through that. Very importantly, there is a new thing that's happened with these drugs. For the first time ever, the FDA has given an approval for a diabetes drug for reduction of risk of cardiovascular death in people who have diabetes and established cardiovascular disease. Because in the clinical trials that have been reported with this class, at least the first of them, there was a 38% reduction in risk of cardiovascular death by the use of this drug in people with, this was in type 2 diabetes, for which is, it is approved. Okay? We've never had that before. The second drug in this class will report on its cardiovascular outcomes trial in about three and a half weeks. So there's real excitement here that there are benefits beyond lowering blood glucose, lowering blood pressure, or reducing weight. This is a new discussion that we're having. There are some issues that have arisen. We have to take a new look at diabetic ketoacidosis, especially if insulin taking patients take this kind of drug. I told you it can reduce your blood, your, 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 your body's volume, your, your plasma volume. Well, when, you can, can, when you're taking something that can, can dehydrate you, you know what the risk is. If your insulin levels go down, your glucagon levels are still going to be relatively high if you've got diabetes. But we would expect under those circumstances, when you get dry, your insulin levels go down, your glucagon levels are high, now you've got a problem with the risk of ketoacidosis. But one thing about ketoacidosis, when they build up, when those ketones build up in your blood, they tell on you because you get these symptoms. You start feeling awful, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, sleepiness, dry mouth, flushed face, fruity smelling breath. We used to tell people when these signs and symptoms happen, you should check your blood sugar and if it's above 250, we would give them a number, then you should be checking your ketones. Because DKA is normally associated with what? High blood sugars. If you're taking one of these drugs, the rules change. If this drug is working, your blood sugars could be in a more normal range and you could still have DKA. Why? Because you're dry, your insulin levels have gone down because say you were sick. You couldn't keep stuff down by mouth. You're getting ready to have a procedure. So you, you cut back on your insulin dose and you, you're NPO, nothing by mouth. Those circumstances, if you start developing these signs and symptoms, you would normally check your blood sugar to see whether you got DKA. Well, you check your blood sugar and the blood sugar looked pretty good. People did that and they, they didn't think they had DKA, but they did. So now we have to change the rules if people taking insulin are also uh, taking one of these SGLT2 inhibitors. So it's just a newness that we have to confront because of advancements that we're making. And the final thing I'll say about this is SGLT2 is a transporter that works in the kidney to capture glucose, okay, and, 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 and either put it, back into the, and put it back into the bloodstream the way I described. Well, there's another transporter related to it called SGLT1, which captures glucose from your gut. When you eat stuff, that glucose and galactose are captured by SGLT1 and put into your bloodstream, and that's what goes to your pancreas and to your tissue. Well, now they're developing drugs that can inhibit both of these things. So you not only can get 
in your kidney, glucose shunt it to your bladder so that you can basically pee it out. My wife says I should say urinate it out. <laughs> but you can block what's happening in the gut so that less of the glucose that you eat gets absorbed. So this is now under development, hadn't been approved. And, and I, if I have to say this word, soda glyphosin, you have to say this word, soda glyphosin. That's, that's the, the dual inhibitor. Okay, is that all there is? What's the bottom line in all of these injectable drugs and now pills that you're telling me about? Well, what I would like to emphasize is this. Additional medications may be desired, and they may be good, but let me assure you that based on everything that we know, all of the advancements that we've made, they are not necessary to achieve good control of your diabetes. And we know that. I had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Devlin just a minute ago, 65 years with type 1 diabetes. Okay? So we know that it's not necessary to have additional tools to achieve good control. But your body still requires, because that's, we know that your body still requires insulin as a treatment. And we are really, really fortunate to have some very good insulins. Things have really come a long way. But that's not all there is. There are some additional tools that we don't have to wait for if it's a fit for you. Simlin is available now. It has its ups, it has its downs. GLP-1s and SGLT-2 inhibitor drugs are approved for type 2. But studies are underway, and you've seen some data that studies are definitely generating data for the FDA to consider whether or not there are circumstances under which they can be helpful in type 1. All of this, I think, points to the dawn of a new day of treatment possibilities for type 2 or uh, type 1 diabetes therapies. So that maybe with insulin, maybe that's not all there is. But in order for you to know, you got to stay in touch with your healthcare team, with your educators, and you got to keep coming to this summit because this is where you're going to find out stuff like that. Thank you all very much. <laughs>